everybody. Welcome to Rock and Roll Shinsu Chu, episode number 80. My name is Gabe Estel. I'm here with my co host Jonathan Getz and Dennis Levi Leach. Good evening, guys. How are you? Uh, fantastic. Great. Well, also, we've got a special guest tonight, Patrick Sullivan. Patrick organizes the Tall Tale Music Fest, Tall Tales Music Festival, which is held in Burlington, Wisconsin, just a couple hours north of Chicago. Tall Tales is a free festival taking place on August 11th and 12th. And we'll feature the Wild Reeds from Los Angeles. I listened to them earlier today. Very good. Aaron Ray from Nashville. And the Dove and the Wolf, who are from Paris. Now, I'm going to assume that's France, not Texas, right, uh, Patrick? Or that's, that's correct. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, among many other artists, uh, you can learn more about the festival at Tall Tales Festival. Dot com. Well, first of all, thanks for hanging out with us tonight, Patrick. We appreciate it. Good to be here. Yeah. So if you could jump right in, we'll talk about the Tall Tales Festival since it's really on the horizon. Um, what was kind of um, the idea for it? Like, how did, uh, how did all of this start? How did you conceptualize it? This was... Uh didn't have any background or anything in, the, in music, uh, in... Uh, production, any of that. Uh, it really came about from uh, some family members opened a, a little coffee joint in Burlington here, and uh, the coffee house is just on Pine. They started hosting uh, open mic nights, and the music, the response to that in the community was incredible. Um, just the way that people kind of came out of the woodwork with their guitars and saxophones and whatever to just play. Um, there was clearly an audience for music, and they had never had a venue to really gather at. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think it was about maybe a year into the coffee house um, after the music had taken off, and we had a local radio station had been hosting some bands, national touring bands had been passing through, mm -hmm. um, and they'd bring them in for a show. And we just started kicking around the idea of what if we just build a little festival and uh it's, there seems like there's an audience and an appetite for it and so that was really it there was nothing special other than having a hunch that people might want to come listen to music and and uh thus it was born awesome good deal it's really cool too that it's happening in a smaller town as well i think that's um it's something i think small towns need more of and you know the appetite's really there i think like you said it's just people don't always think to tap into it you know no they they the assumption is that they're going to leave town right they're going to right. from burlington they're going to go to milwaukee uh or chicago to catch a show um and we thought being in this kind of this triangle in between chicago madison and milwaukee right. um that there's constantly bands basically driving right by us on the way uh -huh. to one of those bigger cities to play so why not peel them off and and have them uh, experience something a little bit different uh, instead of the typical club gig uh, in a bigger city they can come to a small town and maybe experience something that they're going to remember um and then on the, on the flip side give the audience in this town some something that they'll remember as well uh, mm -hmm. right here in their town so it's um everybody wins really a point of civic pride really it can be it I is think. yeah <laughs> it is. um well you talked to us a little bit about the conceptualization of it um as far as organizing it, um, like kind of what were the main steps? What were what were the hassles? You know, um, <laughs> what is it? What does it take to that you can discuss at least? What does it take to organize something like this? Yeah, the the most, I think one of the more interesting pieces of this is knowing that, like I said, the first year we knew nothing about this. We didn't know how to book a band other than maybe the type of cover band, a local cover band that would play at the beer tent at the church fair. Sure. Um, that was about the extent of the local music scene. And so um, it, it was a lot of just uh, learning on the fly. And so calling a, a booking agency because you have your eye on a band and, uh, and asking, you know, are they available? And then trying to piece together, how, you know, how do you know what to offer them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and that's so it's it was a lot of just a lot of Google and research to see where bands were playing, what size venues. Um, what, what their ticket price was and trying to extrapolate what kind of an offer or guarantee they're getting. Um, and so just a lot of trial and error. And then the, the other difficult thing is actually getting a booking agent to respond to your, to your email when you're, when you're sending something from Burlington, Wisconsin that they've never heard of. And so uh, 
the, the, the interesting piece of this is that the first year for every 10 emails I would send out to a booking agent, I'd be lucky to get one response. Um, going out of, you know, almost five years later, uh, it's, it's virtually 10 out of 10 times you'll get a response now. So that's kind of the, the progression is that it gets a little bit easier every year as you build a bit of a reputation um, and build relationships, really, which is the whole thing, whether it's with bands or with booking agents or managers. Once those relationships start to develop, it gets a whole lot easier to deal with the logistics of, of booking and bringing bands to town. Right, right. Very cool. Um, now, as far as <clears throat> what distinguishes Tall Tales kind of from some other music festivals, I think he touched on that a little bit, but um, maybe just as far as maybe the, obviously the setting is a little bit different than than some music festivals, but um, anything about sort of the lineup that um, uh, you think maybe separates uh, it from, from other festivals? Yeah, the, the interesting thing about the lineup, and, it, and this was born out of necessity and still is, is this way, is that um, the, the thinking about putting to get, piecing together a budget and really doing it on a shoestring, and it gets a little bit easier to do this every year, but you're really trying to bring the bands into town that you feel are, are on the cusp of kind of emerging and launching into, into bigger things in their career and that put on a great live show. Um, and so those were the, the kind of the two things I look for is that there's some, some kind of undercurrent bubbling up of, of energy and momentum for them. Um, uh, so they're just, they're basically on that, that verge. And then uh, through a variety of, of ways, whether it's going out and, and checking out a show at a club in Chicago or something, something like that, or, you know, obviously the, the YouTube, um, searching for live videos, just trying to capture who gives a great live performance. Because ultimately with this type of deal, you're not bringing in name bands that the audience is necessarily going to be familiar with. Right. Um, so they need to be wowed is the, the primary thing because your reputation is built on, we don't necessarily know who we're going to see, but we know it's going to be good because last year was good and the year before that was good. Sure. So that's the, that's the whole game for us. Well, yeah, that's exciting that people come to expect, you know, something good, even if they don't necessarily know what it's going to be. Um, and I was looking at the the Wild Reeds, who um, I assume are the headliner, right? I don't have the whole lineup right in front of me. On right? Saturday night, correct. They're yeah. Saturday night headliner, yeah. Um, yeah, they're 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 open in a few dates for Lord Huron um, a little bit later uh, in August. And they're opening in, up for St. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. They're at Newport Folk Festival this weekend. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. I believe. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yep, a lot of great reviews from that, uh, which was good to see. You know, you kind of this is the time of year where I'm just tracking to see what what the bands are up to, and and the amount of um, positive feedback that you saw on on Twitter and Facebook and social media for the Wild Reeds performances this weekend at Newport was very encouraging. Awesome. Um, so that yeah. that's one that we're we're excited about. Uh, yeah, it looks like this fall too. They'll be the opening act for the Lone Below's entire tour, so that'll mm -hmm. that'll that'll put them in front of some bigger, put them playing in some bigger rooms too. Absolutely. Nine Thirty Club in DC, I saw is on there. You know, a couple House of Blues performances. So yeah, really. Yeah. Really yeah, cool. I have so, a, yeah. a mus musician friend in Indianapolis who saw them at the Hi Fi there. Uh, oh, okay. It's over the winter and said it was. Uh, it goes to a ton of shows and said it was probably the best live show he's seen in the last couple of years. So. That's uh, that's an endorsement that I'll take. <laughs> right on, right on. Um, as far as uh, the, the other couple of the other acts that are on the bill, um, can you tell us a little bit more about Aaron Ray? Yeah, Aaron's uh, Aaron's an interesting story because that's a, that's an artist that I manage right now um, and work with on an almost daily basis. Um, so she uh, she's an artist that, and this is going to kind of circle back to the idea of building these relationships, but. Uh, through some of the other Nashville bands that we've uh, worked with over the last couple of years at our festival, um, she was a name that kept popping up uh, the last couple of years. And so I reached out to her uh, almost two years ago to come to Burlington for Tall Tales. Um, we became friends. And then uh, through some of the people that we do business with on the music uh, side of things with management recording, uh, she and I just uh, started working together. And uh, so She's an interesting case in that um, we just uh, wrapped up a month-long UK tour. 
um, kind of a press tour, and we're also prepping to get her her next uh, full length out uh, early next year. Oh, right on. Yeah. Good deal. And then um, I, you have some other folks, the Dove and the Wolf, uh, coming all the way over from France. So yeah, uh, w- yeah. What about them? They are um, so they are yes, they're from Paris. Um, right now, when they're in the states, they call uh, Philadelphia home. Okay. Um, and and another another band that I met um, through some mutual musician friends, and uh, they out of Philly, they're they're tapped in with the like the War on Drugs crew, uh, and I, and I so their their last EP that came out in the spring was produced by uh, one of the guys in War on Drugs, and nice. forget who exactly, but that's uh, you, you hear that in the production of that that record. There's that same kind of. Um, I don't know, almost the the breezy, you know, the summer, sure. great summer listening with the windows down and kind of out on the road. They're they're of that same spirit, so uh, that's going to be a great you know, summer afternoon set for sure. Well, if they've got that circles stamp of approval, I think says a lot. You know, it's a really yeah. really talented yeah. career with Kurt Vile and that kind of circle yes. as well. Yes. Yeah, so good deal, excellent. So, yeah. um, go ahead, Jonathan. Oh. I'm sorry. Sure. Just a quick question. Uh, what should uh, people who have never been to Burlington um, or Tall Tales? Uh, what should they expect uh, when it, uh, uh, when coming to Tall Tales, and how might it be different than a traditional festival uh, in terms of atmosphere, parking, admission, uh, concessions? Sure. Well, the 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 good news is it's free, <laughs> so so Can't that differs that. from from most music festivals, and that it's. It's free, um, and I think also the, the the vibe and the intimacy to it. Um, so we, we we bring in a stage and plop it down uh, right out on the streets of downtown Burlington, um, outside of the coffee house, and uh, it just it feels uh, you feel like there's this kind of connection with the artist, and the, I think the artists pick up on that too. So what you don't see is artists load in play their set, load out and, and get out of town or go back to the hotel. What you do see is the artist hanging out in front of the stage for the remainder of the evening watching every subsequent band that plays. You see a lot of collaboration, which is fun. And so that's something we try to do um, on purpose every year is we have kind of this loose network. Um, and so there's some core bands that can kind of link up with everyone else. And so you'll you'll see bands pulling up artists that have played earlier in the day, Usually at the end of the day, it, it evolves into some sort of uh, just big free for all jam where they're everybody's pulling everyone else up for songs and and some background vocals and it's um, I think two years ago there was a gentleman that was pulled out of the crowd and ended up strapping on the bass guitar and <laughs> and kind of wowing the crowd and he was a, a local guy from a, one of the surrounding communities and it was an amazing story because he used to actually tour with. Um, some fairly big bands in the seventies playing bass, <laughs> bass guitar for them. He's um, a ringer. So he, he was a ringer for sure. Um, so it is, it's like, it's about intimacy and collaboration and kind of just seeing things that um, pop up spontaneously that you won't necessarily get at, at a, a bigger, more, um, uh, more kind of formally structured festival. Yeah, I'm 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 really uh I'm I'm putting I'm looking at the website right now, the lineup, and I'm I'm putting all of these into my my music queue as we speak. Um I've actually heard of Coco Riley before. Um so uh yeah, really really exciting stuff, man. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, t- the tall, um, the website has a nice uh for anybody listening to tall, the talltalesfestival.com has a nice uh list of of everybody with in YouTube videos embedded so you can quickly uh, get a taste of what it's going to have to offer. Yes. Very cool. And also, um, yeah, you can donate and volunteer for the festival right here on the website as well. Yes. So, even better. <laughs> Very yeah. important. Yeah, good deal. Um, now, as far as like partnering with like local businesses and things like that in a smaller community, um, did you feel like you had like a lot of leverage since you know you've you know you're from the area? Um, you know, the coffee shop was going. Mm-hmm. Or is going um, was was that something that was kind of easy to pull off because it was so localized? It's not easy. Yes easy, no. easy is a strong word, but um, 
Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I mean, well, yes and no. I mean, yes, in that you have, being a small town, you have personal relationships um, with people that you're you're not walking into a business necessarily cold um, right. asking for something. You're walking in and you know, you know, you might know the owner, you might know someone who works in marketing or, or, sure. or whatever. So there, that's it's an easier easier from the standpoint of you. You have someone, you, a face you can go to that you know, and you know they're going to listen to you. Doesn't doesn't necessarily mean it's always a yes, but um, but you know you're going to have have them listen and be receptive to what you're what you're trying to build. I think the easiest part about this is that every year, watching the attendance at least double every year, that's really the power. Is when you get um, a business owner, uh, and this happens every year. You get a business owner or even a private citizen that shows up for the first time and just steps back and says, wow, <laughs> I had no idea this was going on in town. And and then next thing you know, there's a check in your mailbox for the following year's festival. So that's that's really the power of it, is the event in, in and of itself does a lot of the marketing, from uh, is, at least as far as the fundraising goes. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's where we count on uh, getting people turned out, getting them excited about what's happening continuing to offer and, and develop uh, a little bit more every year. Um, so in addition to live music, we do a lot of uh, music workshops throughout Saturday morning and afternoon where um, it's anything from songwriting to um, instrument specific lessons. Some of them are curated by uh, artists that are in the lineup. Some are curated by area music educators. Um, so it's it's that whole immersive experience that get, gets people excited about uh, about mu- about listening to music, about participating in music. Um, so it's just we're just feeding off that energy, really. Very cool. That's a pretty comprehensive and and unique <laughs> approach for a festival, I would think. Yeah. 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 Our artists. It's it's funny. Artists are. Um, I had an artist, uh, <laughs> Christopher Paul Stelling. He's a great uh, East Coast uh, artist, and he. Um, he came to Tall Tales uh, two years ago, right from Newport, basically, um, and he played Friday in the evening, and then Saturday before they had to get down to Chicago, he was just kind of walking around and watching these workshops happening, and he walked up to me and he said, if I ever come back, you better ask me to do a workshop. He <laughs> said, nobody ever asks us to do workshops, and I would love to do it. And so that was a, kind of a light bulb moment where you just assume these guys are touring and they're tired and they, they don't want to really... And, have to engage on that whole other level with um, with the local community, and what I found out is that more often than not, they'd love to do something like that. So, um, so that's a piece of it that will continue to grow as well. Oh, nice, cool. Um, well, yeah. Well, we're really excited about it, and we'll be uh, we'll certainly be uh, um, stay in tune. I want to tell everybody, uh, remind everybody of the the URL again. It's talltalesfestival.com. Um, that's tails as in spin a tail, T A L E S. Um, and then also you can follow the festival on Twitter and Instagram at tall tales festival. So, or tall tales fest, excuse tall me. Tales uh, fest, yeah. Tall tales fest, pardon me. Uh, but then check out everything at tall tales fest, uh, tall tales, uh, festival.com. Really, really exciting. Um, well, I want to move on a little bit now and, um, talk about music festivals uh since we're in the season as well as we got tall tales coming up um are there any bands that maybe perhaps you stumbled upon at a festival uh if not a festival maybe just any live show perhaps where they were the opener of a band that you went to see uh, or maybe you saw them on tv one night or just i don't know stumbled across them somehow so where you had no frame of reference for the band uh but now you know they they left a really lasting uh, impact on you and you you listen to them a lot now uh, so I guess Patrick we'll start with you since you're our guest here uh, is there anybody like that that you've seen that uh, really resonated on that level with you yeah absolutely I think the one that springs to mind right away is uh, the UK uh, post-punk group Savages uh, yeah. so. saw them I think I perhaps had heard a song on um, when their debut uh, album came out maybe on like all songs considered um but it really was i got a i got an invite from a madison friend um that he had an extra ticket for the show and did i want to come up 
And so I made the drive and it was just a powerful uh, live performance. One, just the, the quality of that band and how tight and how each individual piece operates was incredibly impressive. And you put this all together and I, I just, I can't emphasize enough that if Savages are, are in your area to check that show out because you won't, you definitely won't forget it. And I've gone back and seen them two more times since that initial show. So it's, it's kind of on my must see list whenever they're passing through. Yeah. One of my favorite records of last year, uh, by, by them. Oh yes. That's really, right. really good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Savages. Levi, what about you? Um, well, I know one that you're going to talk about as well. Well, you know uh, what? You can you can talk about them, though. I bet, I, I bet, I've, got, I bet I've got a, all three of us have it on the list. I, yeah, yeah. I, I've, got, I've April, got a couple. Of April 8th <laughs> in the year 2000. Holy shit, uh, you have the date. Hell yes, I have the date. You know the date your life's changed. <laughs> it was Mississippi Nights, St. Louis. Uh, Mara, over and up for Government Mule. And come to find out, they just played in Springfield, Illinois last night. Huh. First, yeah, yeah they, Saturday. They headlo- headlined uh, this little thing down there called the Down Town Home Festival. Festival, which is yeah. really cool. Really cool that they're doing yeah, that. Yeah, we wish I could have been back for that. But um, yeah, it, it was one of those cases where I don't think either of the three of us, you know, no one was really paying attention to him. No one was at the front of the stage. No, you know what I mean? It was one of those kind of opening at crowds to where yeah. people really weren't that into it. But it was like once they started, it was like. It was like a steam locomotive. How could you not pay attention to it? You know what I mean? Yeah. It was uh, it was it was definitely something I you know I never forgot. And then come to find out, you know, we bought the CD that night. I think Daryl did, or somebody that was with us. Somebody bought the CD because we ended up with copies of it. And um, it you know to find out it was helped and produced by steve earl and like just Mm -hmm. the whole story of it and their whole sound and you know as soon as he starts singing you immediately know it's it's that band you know and so yeah that's definitely one of the ones at the top of my list um that's one of the best records of the last 20 years too oh yeah yeah yeah. kids in philly yeah kids in philly i'm sorry the kids in philly yeah yeah um and so uh another one I, Bonnaroo three years in a row I kind of had an experience like this in 2006 it would have been American Minor yeah. I, I happened to be walking by the smallest stage which was all the way at like the back of the main stage and um, they were going on stage at the little tiny tent and I happened to stand there and watch them play and it was awesome they played basically the whole album their self titled album from 2006 And so um, the next year in 2007, I saw Jonah Smith, who made a really big connection with me. I bought his CD right after the show and listened to it for like two years straight. Uh, For those that don't know, he kind of has like an early Elton John kind of sound. And um, he had gotten signed to Relics Records, and that's how he kind of got hooked up with that festival. And uh, his self-titled record from Relics Records from 07 is great. And then in 2008, we happened to be going by the stage. We thought Mastodon was going to be starting, but we looked at our schedule wrong. And it was this band coming on called The Sword. And so we're like, oh, I wonder what these guys are going to be like. And then they played How Heavy This Axe. And it was like a wall of thunder. It was, I, I imagine it was like what people felt like the first time they heard Black Sabbath. It was like, I was just like, whoa, like, who the hell are these guys? <laughs> it's a good fallback plan from the, from Mastodon is the story. <laughs> right. I mean, they right? could, yeah, they could easily open for Mastodon. <laughs> easily. You know? I mean, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the last thing is a TV show. And you guys, you know about this. We've talked about it probably in the past, I know. But in 2014, when Parquet Courts played Jimmy Fallon, I just happened to be watching it live that night, and they're like, yeah. oh, up next, Parquet Court's doing Stoned and Starving or whatever. And, yeah, I was like, oh, wonder what this is going to be like. And they started playing, and it was just with, like, this raw energy that just came right through the TV at you. And uh, what's funny is you cannot find that clip anywhere online now. It's like 
Weird. I don't know if all the Fallon show, the late show Fallon show clips got taken off or what. But it, yeah, it's one of the best performances of that song they ever did. Out of all the live YouTube videos I've seen, mm-hmm. they, they just shredded on that show. Their, their last two records are really, really strong, too. I, oh, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, those guys are great, man. I uh, actually heard about them. I think you mentioned them on the podcast like, you know, two, three years ago. Well, yeah. So, like, yeah it yeah. was like as soon as I saw them, I was like, wow, I think these guys are going to be good. Yeah, really good stuff. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Jonathan? Uh, so, yeah, obviously with um, uh, Mara and, uh, and I have a couple obvious ones, and it's and it's painfully obvious where I was super late to the party. And uh, one was at a... At, 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 Jonathan's at, like, who is this Aerosmith they speak of? <laughs> Actually, it's, it's a little more embarrassing than that, even. Um, uh, the, the first not-so-obvious one... Uh, was at Pearl Jam 20 at Alpine Valley uh, near Burlington, Wisconsin, uh, a few years ago, uh, five or six years ago now. And uh, leading up to that, I had started to get into this band that was huge about 10 years prior called The Strokes. Some of you may have heard of them. (laughs) Anyway, and I kind of, you know, when they were big, I listened, I enjoyed it, but I didn't get into it. Um, But uh, a few years ago, I started to listen to it, and I got into it a little bit more. And then when I saw him at PJ20, it just totally blew me away. And I was like, I get it. You know, to see the live performance, um, it it pulled me over. And granted, it was pretty much the same set list for both nights. They played both nights uh, at Pearl Jam 20. and But that didn't matter. Like, there was still, uh, there was still a, a, a rock and roll precision and rawness at the uh, simultaneously that that just you know hit me over the head and and convinced me that uh that that i would i I was right in in being more curious about this band that again was immensely popular like 10 years before (laughs) so late to the party on that one um uh, second one uh was when i was probably uh 15 uh the bruce springsteen uh live in new york city was showing on hbo and up to then, I, 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 it may have been like 97, so 17. Um, up to then, I, my impression of Bruce Springsteen was all I heard on WYMG in Central Illinois, which was, um, it, it was still a lot of the 80s stuff with obviously it was some... Mainly, yeah, it seemed like all they would play is stuff off Born in the USA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so my impression of Bruce at that point was just kind of this kind of cheesy pop rock. <laughs> Uh, as a result, and then I saw this live in New York City show that that he had exclusively for HBO, and it, you know it's, it was like going to church, <laughs> and, uh-huh. <laughs> and and I got it. Uh, I understood all of a sudden, and realized that uh, uh, there was much more to Bruce than uh, uh, than 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 the back of his jeans. Um, uh, so again, late late to the party, but uh, um, I never looked back. Nice, nice, good stuff. Uh, so a little bit of a different twist too, with getting into some established artists as well. Um, well, for me, I'll, I'll, I'll mention two. Um, uh, obviously, the artist that Levi mentioned, Mara, had uh, had a, uh, a pretty big effect on me. But about three years ago, uh, I went to go see The Cult for the first time, um, who've become one of my favorite bands in recent years. Um, uh, kind of, you know, they were, uh, they've been around for 30 years, but, uh, I, I just started getting into them about five, six years ago and saw them for the first time live in 2014 at, um, Concord Hall in Chicago. And I arrived, um, uh, I think the opener had played like a tune or two. Um, so, you know, I, I probably got to see about 20, 25 minutes of the opener and the opener was this band called Electric Citizen, um, who's a great band out of Ohio. Uh, they're on a, a really good record label too called Writing Easy Records. It's got some other great bands on it. Yeah. Um, and uh, and they're also one of the best. Writing Easy is one of the best Instagram follows too, by the way. It's they do awesome. some really nice vinyl packages. They do. Know, yeah, know, they do. With different colors or marbles right. or, yeah. Yeah, it's like, the, it right. Writing Easy Records is like, 
everything that like even they're not on that label but everything that fu man chews about like riding easy is about you know <laughs> like like el caminos in the desert and stuff like that yeah, yeah. um but anyway uh so i saw this band electric citizen open up and i was just knocked out um i they sound like um if like ann wilson of heart was fronting black sabbath uh that's what they sound like um so yeah really good it's a husband and wife um team uh that she's the vocalist obviously and he's he's the lead guitarist and uh i think he writes most of the tunes and they're just really really good really energetic live show um it's it's got a very you know sort of you know master reality kind of 70s you know um feel to it um uh, yeah really good stuff so yeah electric citizen um and then uh another band that i had never heard of i think i think jonathan and i saw them but then i also think i saw them at riot fest so i can't remember which was first i think jonathan and i saw them at pitchfork right but i believe i also saw them at riot fest i just can't remember which one was first i think it was we saw them first um and they're a band called mets they're out of toronto not to be confused with the new york mets they spell it with a z <laughs> Um, it's actually Howard Johnson's in the band. It's a song. <laughs> just kidding. Um, and uh, yeah, they they're they're heavy. You know, um, it's it's got kind of a you know there's there's a little bit of screaming going on, which uh, sometimes turns me off. Uh, but it's uh, it's a really powerful sound. Uh, they're uh, a trio, and and definitely uh, definitely a power trio. Um, it's, uh, I got, it's got like a little bit of a hardcore element to it. Um, but, uh, not enough to where, you know, the songs are redundant. The songs sound different they The songs are, even though, you know, it's very intense vocals, the songs are somewhat sort of atmospheric too at times. Um, so, so really good. So yeah, Mets, uh, had no frame of reference for them or, uh, electric citizen when I caught them. So those would be mine too. My, my favorite part of that show at Pitchfork was we were like five people back from the pit. It was a small side stage at Pitchfork. And mm-hmm. so five, like five people back at the pit and, and the pit was going strong. Like it was serious. Yeah. Like, and, and then all of a sudden you just see this banana peel go flying from like one side of the pit <laughs> to the other side of the pit across the stage, like a rainbow banana peel. <laughs> These Mets fans are, they're all right. They're like, stay healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, I think it it kind of these these examples kind of underscore the idea of like why live live music's powerful, right? Like it's not necessarily. I mean, I've gone and seen you know the Tom Petty's and the Paul McCartney's and the the stuff where you know their catalog front and back, um, but it's really finding spots uh, where you can discover something that's still one of the most powerful parts of music is the seeing something for the first time and not anticipating it and and then just knowing that it's something special that you're yeah. you're kind of you're kind of let in on the secret here. oh yeah well and i mean working at the record shop i knew some people who were who were kind of junkies for the feeling like once the band got a little bit too big they were like oh i gotta get rid of them yeah. and then find oh. the next <laughs> like i gotta find my next hit of like yeah pure, obscurity pure yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah um everybody wants to be first to the party um so yeah well g- good stuff um and uh, you know obviously with with patrick we'll switch gears for a second it's it's more than just a hat he is a brewers fan um and uh being obviously close to Milwaukee as well, um, I assume the Brewers are a family thing with you, Patrick. I, I, I assume so. Yeah. Okay. Ab- All right. Absolutely. Yeah. Right on. Um, I've always viewed them as one of baseball's more harmless franchises. Um, so um, <laughs> I don't know. yeah, I'm not sure how to I, take I, that. I think that's a compliment. I think that's a compliment. I do. I, I, yeah. Maybe maybe you want to be a little more. Maybe uh, you mean like like nice. wholesome, maybe more like. Well, I don't know about like... that. Bud Selig did own them for a while, um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Um, no, I just, gosh, you know, um, maybe because you know it's a smaller market. Um, I think I'm not. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think one of ba- baseball's smallest payrolls, if not the yes. smallest. Um, uh, so yeah, I just I've I've always had an affection for him. I mean I. Obviously, I'm a diehard White Sox fan, and I really, 
don't really even have any other favorite teams, you know. I mean, I, you know, I don't root for any other teams. But if, like, you, you know, you, you know, like, held a gun to my head and said, you know what, pick another team, you know, I would. My neighbors to the north, not the Cubs, uh, <laughs> the the, uh, the Brewers would probably get my vote. Uh, so, so yeah. Well, do you want to tell us a little bit, Patrick, um, kind of about sort of your history as a Brewer, Brewers fan? Any highlights, uh, as well as um, you know, you've 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 been to both 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 stadiums, County Stadium and uh, Miller Park, which I, I guess has been around for what, 16, 17 years. Yeah, now. it's yeah. Yeah, so it's not necessarily new anymore, but um, right. yeah. So uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about your history. I think it's not unlike anybody, uh, you know, young guy growing up. It's you. You get to that age where your parents sign you up for t-ball, <laughs> and then you're kind of in your off to the races, right? You, you, your summers start to be consumed by, uh, you know, going to practices and playing ball games and. And just immersing yourself in in this game, where I think it's interesting as like a seven year old, and I know they start them much younger now, but um, to to play a game where you're essentially standing uh, fairly <laughs> stationary for large chunks of time is an interesting thing to watch kids uh, try to pull off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and I've noticed this. With, I've got I have two young children, and I've noticed this now with them starting to. Uh, our oldest is seven, and so he's starting to get into uh, sports and and uh, and just watching and coaching his soccer team, just watching these these kids try to <laughs> try to stay engaged and just sure. the, the challenge. So so yeah, I mean it starts with with the t-ball, and and then the interesting thing about growing up in Burlington was. Um, a couple of things that stand out as a, a young person. Uh, one, it's it's the voice of the Brewers is Bob Uecker, um, sure. and he was in a lot of ways one of the, the, the soundtracks of your youth in the summertime. Um, whether you're driving in the car with uh, mom and dad to, to the grocery store or whatever, the ball games on, it's that voice that. Uh, and I guess Uecker was unique in that you could also catch him on. Uh, uh, Mr. Belvedere, you could catch him on uh, Miller Lite commercials. Uh, he was kind of a, a larger than life figure here. But the other interesting thing about we're living in southeastern Wisconsin is that um, regardless of the fact that we were Brewers fans, uh, WGN was also such a, a, a big piece of growing up. And so as I became more of just a diehard baseball fan in general, um, I gotta say, I watched a ton of Cub fan, uh, Cub games growing up because they were always on. I mean, you could sure. summertime flip on WGN and there's there's a game on. Um, and you know, even if I was just around doing something around the house, I just I loved having the game on. I loved you know to hear the call to just the sounds of the ballpark. It's it's like it's like white noise. It's like turning on a fan at night if you're having a hard time going to bed. It's just that I don't know something about that. Um, so yeah, I mean, first ball game experience was, was really growing up with the Brewers in the, the mid to late eighties with, uh, you know, Yount and Molitor, uh, and Gantner were kind of in Dale Swain, I guess, for like my big four, um, and going to that lovable tin shed County stadium, <laughs> um, not, it wasn't much to look at, but, uh, but it was, it was comfy and the Brewers were, um, although not always competing for a pennant, um, they were competitive, fairly competitive ball ball team in the uh, in the late eighties, um, mm -hmm. and so it was just a good experience um, to to be out at that park and uh, so close to home too. I think it was uh, probably about a forty minute drive from our from our driveway to to Miller or County Stadium at the time. So I mean, that was it's it's. It's kind of a cliched story, really. I mean, that's we all, I'm sure we all grew up that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, as far as Brewer stories, um, you have one where BJ Serhoff is involved, right? Um, yeah, this was uh, so uh, an uncle who's in uh, marketing and advertising. This must have been, I was trying to do the math. Um, I think it was 89. 
um, summer of 89. So right in the middle of the, the ball season. And there was a, uh, uh, I want to say it was a cousin's sub shop, which I don't know if, I think that's maybe just uh, a chain in, in Wisconsin here. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, my uncle was involved with uh, some marketing for them and they were opening a new store. So he called my folks up and said, hey, bring the kids. Um, there's some brewers that are going to be here. And um, it turned out it was BJ Serhoff, who brewers catcher, and I think kind of a, also became kind of a utility guy in, in his later years. Uh, and and lo and behold, a, a journeyman ball player who's um, – and so we were in this Re- cousin's that, subs. Um, the journeyman ball player who what? It Terry out for Frank, a second. T- sorry, Terry Francona. Oh, okay. Uh, who obviously went, went on to to bigger and yeah. better things. Yeah. yeah. His ball career. Uh, and so we walk into this uh, empty cousin subs that they were using for a photo shoot, and got to sit down at the booth with our our family and and Francona and Sirhoff, and ate our sub sandwiches and and talk baseball. <laughs> that was that was a and then and you know they signed them. I brought my ball cards and they signed them and it was just a it, kind of a a great story for a a, a young person. Uh, the Brewers did the you know the go on the ball field every summer before a game and take pictures with the players um, and that kind of a thing. But that was the you know the only time in my my um, childhood where I was. You know, sitting face to face with uh, with an athlete that I admired um, for an extended period of time, just talking about school and baseball and and everything else. So that was a that was a highlight. What year Very was cool. that? Do you think? I think it was eighty nine ninety. Okay. Because I, I believe Frank Hona was only on the club for one one season, so it would have been right in that window. And then Surhoff went to Baltimore after the Brewers, right? He like yep. played played quite a few years in Baltimore. He did, if I'm yeah. Not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. So I remember, you know, one of my first games. The no, I'm sorry. The first baseball game I went to was at County Stadium. Um, Patrick, do you remember we uh, we ran into uh, uh, Juan Nieves? In yeah. the parking lot, uh, Juan Nieves. He threw no hitter, right? He not did not, not that day, but he had a no hitter on his resume. Yes, that was. I think that was the, uh, the '87 season when the Brewers started 13 and 0. I think that was right in the midst of that, oh, okay. um, where 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 Yount was playing center field and made his his uh, diving catch uh, to save the no hitter. Oh, I'll I'll have to YouTube that. Yeah. Yes. I don't they're think pretty, he actually had to They were pretty good dive, that but... year. I'm looking at the record. <laughs> they won they won 91 games in '87, so they had to have been close to making the playoffs that year. I would guess. I yes, I, sorry. I, I, I do remember the Nieves story. Yeah, he signed a napkin, I remember. Yeah. He probably had like a little hot dog <laughs> mustard on it. Uh, um, you know, we didn't have our Juan Nieves cards at the at the ready. <laughs> did, did not. <laughs> no, it was, uh, my wallet was full of Rob Deere and Teddy Higueras. Right. <laughs> right. So uh, how would you compare uh, County Stadium with uh, Miller Park? Ah, uh, oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> I know it's apples think, and oranges. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think my love of County Stadium was just the there was nothing there was truly nothing special about. I mean, it was it was a small park. It, there were no amenities, um, but that also meant that it was strictly baseball. I mean, that's the only reason you could go to the ballpark was to watch baseball. Um, now it's. Miller Miller Park is, I believe, consistently rated one of the best values and experiences um, as a ballpark. Uh, you know, from from price ticket prices to um, you know sight lines and and all the things that uh, can contribute to a good experience at the ballpark. But I do go there now with the with the kids, and it's such a it's just such a distraction with all the stuff on the concourse, with the interactive stuff and the uh, the games and the you know the video screens and it's it's just such a different experience now, um, and the, I guess the games the games are still long so they need to distract people or, or capture their attention with other other things these days. Um, so I mean that that's how I would break down the two parks is County Stadium. There, there's only one reason you ever went there and that was to see the Brewers, 
uh, now, you know, you might get invited by a, a, you know, a friend of a friend who's got a business that owns a suite or something like that, where it's more about a, a social interaction versus a ball game. Um, and so part of me is really uh, nostalgic for kind of the minimal, minimalist experience. And that's why I love like going to a, a minor league ball game. Um, because you can still capture that that feeling where it's you're just there for baseball, and maybe a bobblehead, <laughs> perhaps a bobblehead or two. <laughs> Gabe and I even had a, a shared experience at County Stadium in '94. That was right. That Stretch was nice. Season. Yeah, yeah, it, it was nice. We um, uh, we ended up sitting next to this guy. You know, we're I think we're on the third base side, kind of underneath the overhang there a little bit. And we sat next to this guy who had a five gallon bucket of peanuts. And he just like <laughs> let us eat all of these peanuts. <laughs> He's like, Help yourself, boys. Completely sanitary. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Everyone right, licking right. their fingers. <laughs> it was the biggest bucket of peanuts I've ever seen. <laughs> I have not yeah. seen the, the five I've not seen the five gallon bucket of peanuts at, at uh, Miller impressive. Park. So that's another another thing that's that no longer exists apparently. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they well, probably yeah. don't let you bring that in. <laughs> no. I had mentioned a, a couple episodes ago, one of the interesting facts about Miller Park is it's the only stadium that outsells sausages, outsell hot dogs. Mm. Makes sense. Regional. Yeah. 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 What, Every other stadium uh, in the MLB, hot dogs outsell sausages. What do you Miller go for uh, when you're at Miller Park, Patrick? What do you eat? Um... It's I definitely sausages. So I'm more um, if it's not the the Wisconsin staple of bratwurst, um, you know Italians, Polish, um, you know that's it. <laughs> the sausage has become uh, synonymous with brewers through you know through their their sausage race uh, around the uh, the uh, warning track. Um, yeah, that, and I, but I do think that's a very Wisconsin thing. Is you, you, even you go to a barbecue in the summer, and there might be like two lonely hot dogs on the corner of the grill. And that's just <laughs> it's loaded up with with bratwurst, and there's like twenty different flavors of bratwurst now. <laughs> just furthers my affection for right. your your We're state in a gold of Wisconsin age of bratwurst. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it's it's a it's a newer par- well newer park, um, so you can. I've been there a couple times, and you you can get about anything. You know, they have like just stupid yeah. like like sushi is there probably. You know, brought bratwurst maki, if you will. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, got a little little dabble of uh, brown mustard in the middle of it. Um, but anyway, no, it's uh, I, I I've had a good experience there. Um, you know, it, I, I think the sight lines are are fairly good, if I remember correctly. I've only been there twice. Uh, and it's been a few years, but, um, you know, for a new park, um, I, I think architecturally it's pretty unique. It doesn't, it doesn't look like any other park in my right. opinion. So. And good tailgate. And I should mention that that's another, um, very heavy Wisconsin tradition is the importance of your pregame tailgate. So okay. that's, and, and Miller park is definitely built for tailgating. And, and, and these, they, the subsequent pastime DUIs as well. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> if we're gonna lead the nation in something, but all right. Sausages <laughs> and DUIs. <laughs> and and that's actually kind of unusual for an MLB uh, team to have a good tailgating scene. That's sure. not something you often associate with MLB. Right. No, yeah, Absolutely. it would never fly at Wrigley Field. There's no where to they even do it. <laughs> yeah, you can't really like park and you know, hang out with a bunch yeah. of people. <laughs> yeah, White Sox have have uh, a decent tailgating scene. Yeah, you know the 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 franchise and the park doesn't do anything to discourage it. You yeah. know, so yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean at Coors Field, uh, people show up pretty early. You know what I mean? We've gotten there like you know an hour and a half two hours before the game and they open the gates and let you in they like kind of warden you off to only one or two of the levels until like right you know like an hour or so before game time but like yeah they they let you in and they'll let you like drink and go to any of the restaurants that are open in the stadium quite early i mean but you don't really see people out in the parking lot per se 
Right. Right. Sure. Um, you know, with 1994, Jonathan was or, or Patrick, you guys know. Um, is that the last year the Brewers were in the American League? Oh, didn't boy. they didn't they go National League after the strike? All right, that's, that's think, close close to it, yeah. And actually, so. Patrick, talk about that. What was that like? The idea of moving from one league to another league—that's so strange. Well, well, you lost the DH uh, essentially. So it was right. ninety-eight, by the way. Oh, ninety-eight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, well, I think that was we we're pretty much in the midst of a, a tough run. Um, and so I, I, I don't, I don't recall a lot of pushback against it. I was, I think it was kind of like, well, this isn't working out. Let's, let's go to the national league and see, see if we can make something happen there. So I, I think it was just, a. there's not a lot of fond memories of the brewers from the nineties. I'll put it that way. And so, um, certainly getting out of, uh, or into the national league, uh, was the impetus for, uh, a, a pretty decent run a few years back, um, but rebuilding the farm system and then um, kind of, of hitting hitting the jackpot with uh, you know Prince Weeks and Braun um, that delivered a few really exciting seasons for the Brewers. So and and I think you know some of that's been rekindled now. I mean, granted, it's they've they've had a rough couple of weeks, but mm-hmm. if we could jump to 2017, yeah. Um, yeah, a rough couple of weeks, but certainly you're headed in the right direction as far as a franchise after a few after a few down years, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, savvy, it's, savvy. Um, just, I mean, understanding the small market and and uh, the realities of your your payroll and just restocking that farm system. Sure. Uh, and they just they spent the I think they went from they, in those the those great years with um, as uh, like I said as Fielder and Weeks and Braun and those guys um, came up to the bigs and started having some success. Um, they also made some moves that started to deplete the farm system. And then uh, subsequently it got them into a little bit of trouble. Um, and what they've done the last, I think they were pretty much ranked one of the, uh, the bottom of the farm, uh, the ranking farm system rankings. And in the last two years um, by trading those pieces away and, and replenishing they've they, I think they're, they're right back up in the top two or three in the rankings for the farm system. And then you see some of those guys start to come up now. Um, Orlando Arcia, mm-hmm. um, you know, already flashing the, the uh, tools on defense, but uh, his bats also, also starting to come around now as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, just mentioned, I know before we went on here, we talked about Josh Hader, uh, the pitcher, who uh, I think he's pitched maybe uh, seven innings total this year in middle relief and is averaging about uh, two strikeouts an inning. And I think his ERA right now is like 0.9 or something like that. So um, Lou Brinson's another guy um, who I think came up from, I think that was part of the, one of the Rangers deals. Uh, it might have been the Jonathan LaCroix deal. Yeah, who just uh, got dealt again today, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so and again, exciting guys like that that are, are um, you can build a franchise around again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm I'm uh, I'm curious to see what they're going to do in the off season. You know, because it's like, you know, uh, obviously they're a small market team and there's financial considerations with that. But um, you know, they might only be like you know like an, another pitcher or two away. You know, oh, far yeah, or making some noise. You know, I mean some. I mean they're they've already made some noise this year, but from, you know, um, or, you know, a wild card or something. You know, so not that the wild card's totally out of reach now, but looks like you know that's the Rockies or the Diamondbacks are probably right, going to right. take one of the wild cards. I would guess, uh, or take both of them. I should say. So, but yeah, good good stuff. It's good good time to be a Brewers fan. It is. It's always a good time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, speaking of which, the last thing about the Brewers before we, we move on to our, our, our show your cards uh, closing portion. Um, you know, the Brewers have only, I, I think, you know, they, they, Jonathan had mentioned here in the in the notes, you know, why can't the Brewers decide on a jersey or a logo? Uh, so I, I looked it up. I'm like, well, how many have they had, you know? Um, and they've had like five or so. Uh throughout their time in Milwaukee. Um, but so Jonathan, were you referring to, I, I, 
I was referring to the the that the hat that Patrick is wearing is um the old I think it's seventies and eighties into the nineties Brewers yeah. logo. Ninety three. Ninety three they wore it until ninety okay. three. Okay. And it, there it seems and correct me when I'm wrong here, Patrick, but it seems that there was a lot of fan sentiment always for that logo, and rightfully so. It's one of the best Absolutely. logos in all of sports, that logo. Yeah. However, and they started to reintroduce that into their alternate uniforms a few years ago, and now it's it's like the everyday logo, I think, but it's mixed with their old, or I, sh- I should say it's mixed with their 2000-ish um, uh, Milwaukee jerseys. and. Yes. Wow. And so it's like a mix and match now. What's the deal with the mix <laughs> okay. and match? <laughs> well, I mean that—that's the. Um, I blame the Oregon Ducks. <laughs> 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 they started the whole thing. Now you've got to have you know alternate uniforms, and uh, I don't. Know. The the one thing about the the '90s is they they got rid of this logo for the most forgettable. Uh, perhaps in all of sports history, one of the most forgettable uh, runs of, I think there were two variations, but just a horrible, uh, I think it was like two bats. Uh, it was like, so so uh, two cross bats with like a horrible looking M. Um, finally in the 2000s switched out for that kind of motion M that had like the, I don't know if it's, it's I'm assuming it's like barley or, or yeah. something yeah, like it's that. Supposed to be something like beer. Or, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, then it was, uh, I think it was Friday nights. They started bringing the old ball and glove logo back, um, for kind of retro nights. And I think what you saw was like the, I mean, strictly from dollars and cents, the merchandise, um, it just, it took off. People were buying it. You see, you don't see the, the kind of the newer logo on the street. anymore. It's all ball and glove. I mean, the, the shirts, the jerseys, it's its what sells. And because that sells, um, I think that's why you're seeing it start to become more and more part of the everyday uniform. Yeah. And well, I think they should just... They should replace it completely. I was a fan of the yeah. Barley logo. Yeah. I thought that was... That was probably my least favorite Brewers logo. I, I don't like the, the new ones. I, I, I'll, tell yeah. you, I'll, I'll give them a thumbs down for uniforms. Um, it's... I, I think the the font or the is is uh, I don't know. There's just nothing really distinguishable about it, in my opinion. Yeah. Do you think that they'll ever turn the jerseys back to what to the '80s jerseys? I think they sh- they should. Um, I mean, I don't. I haven't seen. Is, are any teams doing the powder blue like on a, on retro nights? Are they doing the the, the blue jays? '80s powder? Yeah, they're, they're, an, they're an alternate yeah. for uh, well, a not. retro night, but the Royals, that's that's their alternate. I is, think is the, the Cubs powder. wore the powder blues at least once or twice last year. Then, I don't know if they yeah. have this year, though. Yeah, powder blue I, is like the trendiest color in all of baseball over the last couple of years, I think. Yeah, I, I just think like there's a reason that the the Yankees logo and the Red Sox logo, you know, those, those teams endure, even the Royals. Um, simplicity it's like you know it's just it's an, it's attractive to look at and i think there was like this trend in the 90s for sure that probably continues on um although i, I think the tide's turning a little bit where it's it just like i think designers just overthink things or or yeah, started sure. overthinking things um and introducing too many elements and just they went extreme it's just too yeah. clever by half yeah yeah one of the neatest brewers logos is was I think the first, it's like a caricature of a guy hitting the ball and the guy's hey. chest is like a barrel. Yeah. Yep. He's a very, he's a very corpulent individual, isn't he? That one. Uh, yeah. uh, Which is fine by me. Cause I want heavier players in baseball again. All right. I... <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, I like that logo too. Uh, it's, it's got a kind of a, like a, it, it's very seventies. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how else to put it. But but yeah. the the ball and glove logo is uh, I, it's not only classic I, th- I think like the the New York logo and the Boston logo that you mentioned Patrick but it's also the most creative because and a lot of people don't see it we I think we all know 
but the yeah. idea that it uh, it is an M and a B, and and right. you point it out to people, and their mind is blown, like, oh my god, right, that's so right. awesome, and yeah. so <laughs> and you don't get that creativity in a lot of sports logos, and and that's why it was right. a shame that they ever went away from it in the first place. Yeah, designed by a college student as well. Really? Yeah. Wow. Uh-huh. Kid from Euclid. Um, he probably uh, interned didn't get paid anything. So he no, got two thousand no. bucks for the first 2, prize. It was it was a contest. Uh, wow, that's a thousand yeah. more than the that the lady got for the Nike logo, right? Right. <laughs> well, yeah, that one that one endures, man. It's it uh, it's. I'm it's glad it's a good back. one. They've, they've been about style in Wisconsin for a long time. Milwaukee Bucks had the Mecca, right, with the the fancy floor that was like yep. an art piece. They actually yeah. brought that back. Um, Ah. Two, two seasons ago, they kind of they they redesigned and brought back that old uh, art piece floor and have incorporated that into the Bradley Center. And then now, I was just downtown Milwaukee last week, and um, that new the new stadium's coming along quickly. Uh, so that's that's breathing some new life into downtown Milwaukee ah. for sure. Okay. The Bucks, I jersey, about that. Bucks yeah. jerseys are a whole other story. Those are. Those are all these days. <laughs> go, go back to the, all the green. I don't yeah, need to I see like, it. I don't, I don't need a up. deer on my uniform. <laughs> Unless it's like the one from the 70s where it's like the deer wearing the turtleneck. Right. You know, that right. one, right. fine. Yeah. Fine. It ain't broke. Um, cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's go, let's go on to the last cards. portion. Uh, show your cards where we share uh, a baseball card. One that uh, you know we have some affection for, or has a story behind it, or we just like the design. Um, go ahead and, uh, and and do that, uh, Patrick. Why don't you start us off, man? What's uh, what card do you have? Well, I gotta go with uh, going back to the Brewers and the year that was. Uh, uh, and I should preface preface that I, I had to scramble. I had I could find one one booklet of cards that was uh, not buried by totes of kids clothing and toys in our basement so but i lucked out it was a decent one um but probably the year that was uh that really maybe 86 but 87 really is when i truly became a baseball card fanatic um and this is my favorite favorite player of all time and the guy that uh probably made me love baseball more than anybody and that's the uh let me see if I can get up here. The 87 uh, tops, Robin oh, yeah. Young's. Yeah, we're classic. Rock and Robin. Yeah, beautiful. Um, he is. He's he's such an institution. You know, you talk about the divide between um, the love for Molitor and Yount in the 80s, and um, and Yount still. I mean, he's still such an integral part of the Brewers franchise, and he's. He's there a lot, and he's involved in events, and he's just so beloved that, uh, you know, it wouldn't surprise you at any given day at the ballpark for the bullpen to open up for uh, Young to come rolling out on a Harley Davidson, you know, around the warning track like he did back in, I think he did that a couple times back in the day. Um, Awesome. He's just, yeah, he's just synonymous uh, with Brewers baseball in a way that I think uh, even Paul Molitor was not and still is not. Um, yeah, that's my guy. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a good route to go. That was uh, He was one of my first favorite players as well. In fact, my son uh, has my Robin Young starting lineup figure on his uh, – bookcase in his room to this day so right next to his not right next to his janice uh milwaukee bucks bobblehead is my old robin yell starting lineup so nice. <laughs> the, the legend continues <laughs> i'm gonna go next because i i had to scramble as well and i also found a yount this one is a little higher concept um we've talked a lot about on this show about how you know in the early 90s um Baseball cards, um, you know, the market started to get a little oversaturated. You know, you had more companies springing up, and and um, a lot of the the companies were doing sort of more artistic cards. Sometimes they pulled it off, sometimes they didn't. Um, this one I have of Yount, I actually kind of like. Uh, it's not the best artwork, but the it's Fleer, sorry. right? Yeah, it's a Fleer '92. Those were a good I, series. I remember yeah. Those. I, I really and I was looking at some others. I've got these all kind of on one page in my in my book oh. that I was going through. 
got about a dozen of them or so. Um, and I, 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 yeah, I really like the baseball backdrop um, uh, in the sky. Uh, I kind of well, like it's it. like a Salvador Dali painting. Yeah, it is, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this was this was his last work, actually. A lot of people don't know that about him. Um, <laughs> um, but um, anyway. Yeah, so I, I've got this one. This was, you know, this these these cards were all narrative on the back. Um, they didn't, you know, they were just sort of. I don't know, this was one was, of the first. This, was, this was just basically a career a, a career recap. Go ahead, Levi. Was that like ninety one or ninety two? This is a ninety two card. Yeah, that would have been like the first era of inserts. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, you were used to like every card was the same, and then it was like, mm-hmm. oh my god, this card's different. Right. Right. Yeah, those and cool. I, like, I like I said, I've, I've got some mixed feelings about some of these cards. Um, just to me, it was kind of like the beginning of the end for baseball cards. Um, it, it's cool, but you know, they just they start doing too much. But uh, this one I yeah. like. This one stands out. Yeah, cool. You want to go, Jonathan? Yeah, I'll go. Uh, mine is uh, from 1982, and of course, I was only two years old, so I took this from my brother's collection. I almost pulled an 82 tops for mine. Oh, yeah, wow. All right. Well, mine's an 82 Don Russ. And uh, it is autographed because um, uh, my uh, my my late grandfather and also Patrick's grandfather was, uh, I think, somewhat connected to the Brewers. And uh, so I actually have the entire 82 Don Russ Brewers team set autographed um, because I think uh, our, our grandfather, uh, Bebop, got them um, autographed for uh, my brother. And so mine is uh, Gorman Thomas. Uh, oh, yeah. Nice. yeah 82 don russ talk the about the powder blues. blue right yeah. there the white facing helmet Beautiful. and the mutton chops and mustache that was the mvp of facial hair that year yeah. um take that raleigh fingers. take that maddie lake <laughs> yeah anyway <laughs> gorman's gorman's still uh hanging around these Is around he? these parts a lot oh, yeah good. yeah he we have a uh, like our, our high school athletic association uh, has an annual like a booster club golf outing, and Thomas is there more often than not every year. Um, he's kind of connected with some guys in Burlington, and he plays golf. Uh, I think out at uh, Grand Geneva, just outside of Burlington, uh, fairly regularly. So you does, see the guy around. Does he still have the same buy a lot of drinks? I would imagine. <laughs> no, he's still got a uh, he's still got a sizable mustache. Uh, the chops are gone, but the, the stash remains. Okay. And so, yeah, I, I looked up his career, and he had, obviously, several really solid years for the Brewers, mm-hmm. uh, you know, amassing quite a quite a few home runs. He was he was Rob Deere before Rob Deere was Rob Deere, essentially. Lots of home runs, lots of strikeouts. And, um, and then the Brewers traded him away to the Indians, and then he eventually came back to the Brewers a few years later, uh, which I thought was interesting. Um, so, yeah, Gorman Thomas, 82 Don Russ. Nice. Well, yeah, the uh, the Brewers were new to town in what '69. Would have been that the year the Brewers started. Is that right? Something like that. '69 or '70. Yeah. I I want to say it was '69 because I think in '68 they were still the Seattle Pilots. Okay. And I think oh, for one year. Yeah. One yeah, year, they, yeah. They they were the uh, they. Can you imagine that happening now? Like <laughs> like if the Florida yeah. Marlins had just been around for one year, just dropping in, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah, it's so strange. Um, but before that, before they moved to Atlanta, they were the Milwaukee Braves, and uh, I have a 1956 Warren Spahn. Wow. <laughs> Whoa. Jeez. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is a holdover from my Topper. days when I was. I was well. I was wheeling and dealing vintage cards for a while, a few years back. Um, you guys kind of do that, but that's one of the ones that I ended up never selling. I have, I still have maybe a stack about that big of cards and holders, and that's one of them. And I, I just always loved these top side cards like that. Beautiful. They did that yeah. in um, '55 and '56, and they're just really good looking cards. Um, and yeah, he was, you know, come on, he's. Like, what, I think he had 20 game seasons, like 13 years or something. Something crazy like that, and he's just one of the greatest pitchers of all time. Yeah. So, yeah. Great delivery, but, too, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. One well, of the last yeah. guys to have that real classic wind-up. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. the the gas house gang type. Like, yeah. <laughs> way up there. Yeah. Good stuff. Nice. Nice spot. Yeah, that's a good one, man. I don't know. I think that's yeah. the... 
Well, dude, I had, you know, first in my hand, I had like an 82 Molitor. <laughs> You're like had... Billy Joe Robido or Warren Spahn. <laughs> yeah, or Warren Spahn. <laughs> well, I, one that I really liked was the 82 Tops Don Sutton. He's got a real nice curl coming out from under his hat. Right. Oh, right. Don, Don Sutton was the king of that, man. Already gray, too. Don Sutton was right? very oh, yeah. premature gray, if I, I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm a fan of the hair coming out from the sides of the hat like that. Right. They right. need to bring that back in baseball. They should. They should. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, more more perms, perhaps. I, I don't perms, know. Perms, yeah. But anyway. <laughs> <you know>. Oh. <laughs> Well, have a lot of fun tonight. Patrick, thanks for stopping by. We really yeah, appreciate so it. I um, wanted to remind everybody again, um, Patrick's Festival coming up here um, in Burlington, Wisconsin. You can learn more about it at talltalesfestival.com. Uh, also follow it on Instagram and Twitter at talltalesfest. So we look forward to that. Um, and also you can learn more about us by visiting rockchew.com. You can get all of the archived uh, episodes uh, as well as links to all of our social media. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Rock in Chew. That's uh, Rock in Chew. Um, as in, uh, gosh, is there anybody? A brewer oh. with a with a with the letter N as a first or last yeah, name. Yeah, right, right. Ned, um, Ned Yost. Ned, yeah, Ned. <laughs> as in world champion manager Ned yeah. Yost. <laughs> Fired by the Brewers when he was in first place, right? <laughs> yeah, follow us at Rock in Shoe and then visit rockinshoe.com. Uh, thank you again, Patrick. Until next time, we'll see you soon. Take care. Peace. Yes. All right.